thank you all for coming today. And it's a real honor to be here at Heartland, um, in a place that really has done a great job in promoting free market principles and individual liberty principles and getting those ideas into the hands of people who can use them to make an actual difference um, in, in the way our country runs. Um, I should also thank your, your uh, mayor in his, in his prior life when you guys had lent him out to DC for a little while. Uh, he made the comment that you should never let a serious crisis go, go to waste. Um, it's an opportunity to do things that you couldn't do before. And that message that he, he sent out was really taken to heart. And the result is Dodd-Frank. Uh, and so the reason that Mercatus decided to put out this book is that there, there's a notion that the financial crisis happened, Dodd-Frank passed, and we have a solution, an effective solution, and there's nothing more to worry about. Um, and what I, what I wanted people to do is take a look, look at what Dodd-Frank actually does and ask themselves again, did it really solve the problem or did it make things worse? Um, before getting into the specifics of Dodd-Frank, I want to tell you a little bit about the process. So when the, when the crisis happened and the government started bailing everyone out, they were bailing out insurance companies, banks, auto companies, um, anyone else that you could think of, they were bailing out. And people were understandably very upset about that. Um, and there was a lot of pressure on Congress to do something. Um, and of course, a lot of people were really suffering um, economically because of what had happened in the financial sector. So Congress was on a mission to get something done fast, uh, not necessarily to get something done right. And so what, what Congress did is they said, OK, we'll, we'll try to understand what caused the crisis. But we're going to do that by setting up a commission that's not made up of, of folks in Congress, but is made up, it's a separate group. And they'll work on that. We'll work on solving the problem without understanding what it is first. So the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission put out their um, document saying what they thought the causes of the crisis were. That came out six months after Dodd-Frank. Um, it was not very well done, so I'm not sure it would have really informed the process anyway. But Still, the notion that you figure out what the problem is before you start trying to solve it is a pretty fundamental one. Um, and a lot of hard decisions were just punted to regulators, um, defining what systemic risk is, which was a lot of focus of what Dodd-Frank is about. They said, that is too hard of a question for Congress. The regulators can figure that out. <coughs> Folks at the Fed are very smart. They have a lot of economists there. They'll think about it and figure it out. Um, and there were a lot of things that were thrown in right at the last minute. Um, they were things that had been on wish lists of <coughs> regulators or special interest groups. Um, and they got them shoved into the bill with very little consideration. And these are items that were not minor, but would have really gotten a lot of scrutiny in normal times. And so the result was Dodd-Frank. The book tries to walk through each title of Dodd-Frank to give you a sense of what the title is what each title is about. There's 16 different titles in Dodd-Frank. Um, and I'm not going to walk through 16 <laughs> titles with you today, but I, I want to talk to you about some of the themes um, and some of what I would say are the pathologies of Dodd-Frank. So we'll talk about five of those today. The first is trust regulators, not the markets, to allocate resources <laughs> and make decisions about what, what folks need and to manage risk. The second is to expand and fortify the safety net, to expand too big to fail. Uh, the third is safeguard the status quo, foster growth of the largest financial entities. And if the smaller ones run into trouble because of the regulatory burden, that's unfortunate, but we'll have a handful of large financial entities. The fourth thing is to limit consumer choice. And the fifth pathology is to limit the accountability of regulators. So pathology number one is regulators know best. Hayek, I think, taught us really nicely and explained to us really nicely how the market is based on expert inputs. The experts are the people who actually use products and services or make products and services. And they're constantly feeding information into the market. And that's all being reflected in prices. And that helps to allocate resources effectively <coughs> and to meet people's needs. And frankly, to tell a producer when its products are no longer wanted or needed. Um, Dodd-Frank rejects this approach. Dodd-Frank says, markets haven't done a good job. 
let's try regulators. So let's just try getting regulators as much information as we can. Let's let them go off on their own, and they can make decisions about allocating risk, about meeting people's needs. They can decide what people need, and they can decide uh, when firms should be shut down and when firms should continue. Um, so there are some examples of this um, that we can run through quickly. The Financial Stability Oversight Council is one of the new entities created by Dodd-Frank, and it's one of the sort of central features of Dodd-Frank that people tout, well, now we have this body of regulators. It's all the top, the top people at the financial regulators come together in the Financial Stability Oversight Council, and they look at the economy and they assess where there's systemic risk. Now, m they haven't figured out what that is yet, but they're, that's their job. And so they're going to stop a problem. They're going to spot a problem and stop it before it becomes a real problem. But the idea, you know, you get the smartest people in the room, they can solve a problem. Then you have the Office of Financial Research, a new bureaucracy created by Dodd-Frank also. And it's intended to be, play a supportive role to the FSOC. Um, they'll collect lots of data. It, it's, it, the idea was started by some, some folks who really liked data and they thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could get all this financial data and we could process it with our computers and we could figure out what's going on. So they have virtually unlimited ability to collect data um, and to sort through it. And, and, and to figure out what's, what's happening. Then the, the next entity is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, also a new creation of Dodd-Frank. Um, and their idea is that they will pick the financial product that works best for you. Um, in fact, it'll work best for everyone. So the mortgages, they'll define the parameters of the mortgage that's ideal for Americans. Another example is in the area of credit rating agencies. So this is not yet formalized, and it may, it may never come to pass. But Dodd-Frank gave the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the authority to set up an entity that would actually tell, for each, for each uh, structured deal, they would assign a rating agency to, to rate that deal. So the government is going to be the one who picks the rating agency to rate particular products. And they'll decide if they're doing a good job or not, and if they can get another job. So totally displacing the market. That idea was um, generated by Senator Al Franken. Um, his colleague, Senator Durbin, came up with another idea, which was, let's, let's try price controls. Because we understand that price controls have worked very well in the past. Um, so he put in a, a provision in Dodd-Frank to control prices on debit interchange fees. So the Fed is now in charge of setting appropriate fees. Uh, the second pathology is government guarantees and too big to fail. Dodd-Frank is often touted as a solution to too big to fail. Um, and again, it's understandable why people would be concerned about this, because during the last crisis, the regulators came to Congress and they said, we cannot let big financial institutions fail. It'll be chaos. Um, so there is a provision in Dodd-Frank that says too big to fail is dead. It doesn't say it exactly like that. But the rest of Dodd-Frank completely undermines that. Um, it did, Dodd-Frank, I will concede, made one positive move in making it much more difficult for the Fed to do a one-off type rescue, such as the rescue of AIG. Um, or actually AIG's creditors are the ones who got rescued. Uh, so that's a lot harder for them to do. But at the same time, Dodd-Frank created a whole new set of too-big-to-fail entities. So now any bank with more than $50 billion in assets is su signif systemically significant. Um, there are non-bank financial institutions, which the Financial Stability Oversight Council, they'll look around the economy and they'll pick out which non-bank financial institutions should be in this category of systemically significant. Um, financial market utilities, which are entities like clearinghouses, will also be selected uh, for this category. And then firms that engage in payment clearing and settlement activities can also be put in this category. So if you get in the category of systemically significant, they take you and they, they give you a special regulatory framework. So you have to comply with more regulations. But the result of that is that the regulators are invested in you. Because wouldn't it be embarrassing if one of these systemically important financial institutions failed 
And then people came to the Fed and they said, you had complete regulatory authority over this financial institution. Why did you let it fail? So the Fed has an incentive to do things behind the scenes to make sure that none of these entities fails. And then, of course, the ultimate too-big-to-fail problem with Dodd-Frank is that it didn't solve the too-big-to-fail problem of the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie not only were not touched by Dodd-Frank, but in the aftermath of Dodd-Frank, they've grown so much that now the government guarantees more than 90% of new mortgages. And so getting the government out is even, it's going to be even harder now because the old constituencies who kept Fannie and Freddie alive before the crisis are very much back at work trying to keep them alive now. Um, another instance of too big to fail being embedded in Dodd-Frank is Title II, which is the resolution authority, which is intended to be an alternative to bankruptcy for big financial institutions. Um, and again, this is a way that the government will be able to take a financial institution that's failing, pick the creditors that they like, and give favors to those creditors. Again, all done through a very <laughs> opaque process, so it will be very difficult to know what's going on and very difficult for other people to challenge what's going on. So the, the next pathology is related to the too-big-to-fail pathology. It's the pathology of crony statism. Dodd-Frank places great value on financial stability, which is understandable. Stability sounds like a great concept, one that we can all get behind, and we saw the consequences of the instability during the crisis. But if you look behind stability, what does it mean? It means that we're going to have a, a handful of big firms, and they'll be stable. They won't come. They won't go. They'll just be there. And they'll be in have a great relationship with the government. The government will regulate what they do. The government will tell them the kinds of products they can issue. And they'll try to stay on the good side of the regulators because that means that their executives can get paid enough and that, you know, that they'll be profitable enough. It's a public utility model. And so banks are going to care a lot more about pleasing the government regulator than their customer. That's not great for innovation. Mm -hmm. And frankly, that's fine because regulators, innovation is scary for regulators because if they pass on, a, on an innovation that turns out to be bad, it comes back to them. So they have this very constant, stable financial, financial stability is what we'll have, but we won't have the dynamism that makes markets work. Um, and frankly, we were just talking earlier about small banks, um, community banks. They have often been known for the fact that they tailor products for the customer base that they know very well. Um, under this new system, one size fits all. If you want to tailor a product, you're running a regulatory risk, and it's frankly not worth it. Uh, the next pathology is a pathology of limited consumer choice. And again, this is tied in with that. Um, Dodd-Frank views investors and consumers as too emotional, too short-sighted, and just not smart enough to figure out which financial products meet their needs. Um, so I think of it like Mayor Bloomberg doesn't want you to drink big drinks. His friends in Washington don't want you to have a 15-year mortgage because it's just not good for you. Um, and so the, the classic example of this in Dodd-Frank is the new Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection, which uh, is really setting out although they're somewhat constrained by the statute, but they're doing their best to set out one-size-fits-all types of regulatory models um, that financial institutions have to abide by, and therefore the products that people get offered will be much, there'll be a much smaller set of options. Um, there are other examples. The Securities and Exchange Commission, for example, is given more authority to determine what the nature of the, of the client financial uh, services provider relationship should be. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission really loves this concept, so they've taken it to say, if you deal with certain kinds of institutional clients, these are not retail clients, these are very sophisticated clients, um, foundations who have money to invest, pensions, um, you have to treat them as if they're retail clients and as if they're too stupid to make decisions for, for themselves. One concern that I have coming out of this is that consumers and investors are being told 
don't worry your pretty little head about that. We will figure out what you need and we'll figure out the products that are good for you. You really don't need to think about this stuff. And that is a very, very destructive um, lesson to be teaching folks. And I think we'll end up getting people really hurt. Uh, the next pathology is one of reduced regulatory accountability. So you would think that given all the power that regulators got in Dodd-Frank, Congress would have said, we're going to give you this power, but you're going to have to come back and tell us how you use it. Um, and we're going to really hold your feet to the fire. But instead, Congress said, you know what? We're going to give you guys all this power, and we're going to prevent you from coming back to us and being held accountable to us. So there are new bureaucracies that are not accountable. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Office of Financial Research are two examples of this. They're headed by a, a, a single person, um, and he's appointed. And once he's appointed, he's appointed by the president and then confirmed by the Senate. Once that happens, neither the president nor the Congress has any ability to pull him back. And so he can do whatever he wants. He sets his own budget um, as, as high as he wants, and he spends it any way he wants. Uh, there are other new bureaucracies. The Financial Stability Oversight Council, which I mentioned, is this this conglomeration of the top regulators. The, the Government Accountability Office took a look at what they have done so far and they said, you are really not transparent. No one knows what you're doing. Um, and one of the great things, if, you, if you're part of FSOC, is you can say, hey, don't ask me about this policy. There are 10 regulators in the room. You might want to talk to someone else. And so they can all point the finger at the other regulators and you can never get a straight answer about what they're doing. Another example is Title II, the resolution regime that I mentioned, which is the alternative to bankruptcy. And this is really pretty remarkable. Um, the government is given broad authority to just seize a company and say, we're going to wind you down. Um, the parameters for, for the companies they can select are very broad. And the ability for anyone to review that decision is extremely limited. Um, the, the company can agree if, if the government comes and says, we're going to take you over. The company can say, fine, we're, we're OK with that. Just go ahead. Or they could decide to fight it, in which case a court has 24 hours to review the decision. Um, and you know, by definition, these are complex financial companies. Um, and the, the parts of the decision they're allowed to review are constrained. Um, and the courts have even said the court had to adopt procedures to see how this would work. And the court said, you really need to give us a little more notice than 24 hours, but we'll see what happens if this, this actually occurs. Um, and the company's not allowed to talk to anyone if it's been designated to be wound down. If it does, um, there are uh, very severe sanctions. And then another thing that Dodd-Frank does is it really encourages regulators to set their own jurisdiction. And regulators are really um, leaping onto this bandwagon. So the Commodity Futures Trading Commission is trying to regulate entities that are already regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and they're trying to regulate internationally because, after all, they're not sure if other countries, European countries, are going to do as good a job. So, And the, the results of what happens in Europe could flow back here. So really, they need to have a broader jurisdiction. The Financial Stability Oversight Council is trying to regulate money market funds, which are already regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and the Fed is trying to regulate everyone and everything. Um, the pathologies are aggravated by poor implementation by the agencies. The regulators are not even conducting economic analysis. They're, so most regulatory agencies are required to conduct re economic analysis. Um, the financial regulators happen to be independent regulatory agencies, so they're not subject to this mandate. But just as a matter of common sense, you would think when an agency is, is adopting a rule that they would say, hey, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Are there different ways that we might think about solving this problem? And which of these, which of these ways would be the cheapest one? But the regulators have really shunned this approach, preferring just to go ahead and adopt whichever whichever approach they think is going to be the most effective. Um, they're also not coordinating with one another. So you have Dodd-Frank is implemented by 
by quite a few financial regulators. And so they're all working on rules at the same time, rules that are going to affect the same entities. Um, but they're all kind of going their own way and, um, and, and doing things at their own pace and in the, in, in the way they want to do it. Uh, we were talking about the Volcker Rule earlier, and the Volcker Rule is one example where all the financial regulators were supposed to come together and adopt a rule. The CFTC decided it needed more time, and so we have uh, very lengthy rules coming out of the financial regulators, and then the CFTC came out with its own um, version, which was pretty much the same, but long enough that people had to, or different enough that people had to at least read it to see. Um, and then you have the SEC and CFTC regulating, both trying to regulate derivatives. They're not coordinating their rulemakings well. You have uh, simultaneous requests for comment. You have people asking for, you have agencies asking for comment on rules before they've even told people who will be covered by those rules because they wait until very late in the process to, de to define key terms. Um, so it's difficult to know if you need to write a comment because you don't know yet whether you're actually going to be affected. Um, they are picking alternatives that are not the cheapest. Um, so there are two pieces of Dodd-Frank that you might think have nothing to do with the financial crisis. Um, one relates to conflict minerals in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, and the other one relates to resource extraction. So my oil drilling and things like that um, in foreign countries to your, your payments that you're making to governments um, in connection with those. Those are both very expensive mandates. Um, they don't apply to financial entities, obviously. They apply to, to regular companies. And, and the SEC didn't really know what to do with these mandates because it's a little bit out of their normal, their normal sphere. Um, but what they decided to do is adopt more expensive alternatives than other alternatives that were available to them. Um, and so they're getting sued. Um, and then another thing is that regulators are moving slowly, which is not in itself a bad thing. They're, they're, they've missed, uh, I think, two thirds of the deadlines, rulemaking deadlines so far. Um, but the problem that I have is that when Congress explicitly asked them, do you need more time? They say, oh, no, 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 we're just going to take our time and we're going to get it right, not get it done fast. What kind of precedent does that set? Congress tells a regulatory agency to do something by a particular deadline, and they say, we don't care. We'll make up our own deadline. And I, I think that's a very unhealthy um, approach to a statutory mandate. And the other thing that regulators aren't doing is they're not telling Congress when they run into problems with implementing Dodd-Frank. There are only a few instances where regulators have actually come to Congress and said, you know what, we're, we need to make some changes here. So why should we care about this? I mean, after all, the financial crisis was bad. And, and the folks who are affected largely can, can afford to, uh, to deal with the problems. But bad financial regulation leads to higher costs and lower, uh, a lower, uh, fewer options for consumers. And it, relate, it, it causes... Um, misallocation of resources. And I think Dodd-Frank also will fuel bigger government in other sectors of the economy. Um, Dodd-Frank itself eliminated the Office of Thrift Supervision, which is great. They got rid of one agency, but added the CFPB, the FSOC, the OFR, uh, multiple new offices at the SEC, and an Office of Minority and Women, uh, I forget what it's called, but Essentially, its job is to make sure that all regulated entities have proper diversity policies. Um, so that's at every regulatory agency. And because the financial sector is the lifeblood of the economy, the pathologies that exist in it are going to flow to the rest of the economy. And finally, um, if the government controls financial markets, then it controls who, which entrepreneurs, which ideas get funded. If wind farms are what we want to fund, then that's where the money is going to go. So giving the government that kind of uh, control over, over financial resources is not a good idea. The question I always get is, well, fine. Dodd-Frank might not be good, but what would you have done? And I would argue that you need to kind of go back a step and say, 
we need to get the government out of making decisions and we need to get the government out of standing there with a safety net. We need to make the market responsible. So investors, uh, shareholders and creditors who, who decide to commit their money to an enterprise should face the consequences when they make a bad decision. And that will force them to monitor, to watch what the institution is doing and to say, you know what, you're taking too much risk. I'm not going to lend you any more money. Um, those are the kind of reforms that we need to make. Uh, we need to get the government out of housing finance. The U.S. is really unique in the huge role that the government plays in financing mortgages. And so if other countries can, can do it, I'm sure that we can pull the government out. Um, and we need to strive for easier and simpler rules, rules that can't be gamed and that, can't, that, that don't give people an incentive to go to government for exemptions. Um, and we need to embrace failure. And that's a horrible thing, a horrible sounding thing, but firms do come and go, and you do need the market to tell firms if they're not doing a good job. But if it's the, up to the regulators to tell firms, the criteria the regulators use are going to be arbitrary. Um, and we need to make regulators themselves accountable to Congress, the President, and the American people. And we need to restore choice to the American people and also give them the message that with that choice will come consequences. And so they need to start thinking on their own about what is good for them um, in the short term and in the long run. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great talk. Uh, there's a feeling, intuitive feeling, sort of, that many of us have that live in the world of small, privately owned businesses, middle market businesses, that there's a conscious effort to turn the U.S. banking system into Canada, where the number of banks is roughly equal to five. Uh, and I'm wondering, is Dodd, was Dodd-Frank in part consciously drafted to help make that sort of corporatist dream come true, or is it an inadvertent consequence? And if it is happening, won't it increase our level of systemic risk more by having fewer banks and each one of them having more power if they fail? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I actually think it was conscious because I think that the people who like this system of several big banks, like the idea of being able to control what those big banks do, what kind of loans they're making, and so it works out nicely. And it, it's it's like a partnership, a government big bank partnership. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with big banks if they grow that way naturally, um, but there is something wrong when the government <clears throat> is standing there to catch them when they make mistakes. And I think that certainly that is going to be the the lay of the land that, right, if one of those failed, it would be terrible. And so um, they will not allow one of those big banks to fail. They'll do whatever they need to do to keep it alive. I was wondering uh, the, uh, with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, where its appropriations uh, are outside a congressional process, uh, would, it, would this be uh, an exaggeration to say, you know, this goes back to almost medieval era where the king doesn't have to go to parliament for, uh, you know, for, for appropriations? Is, what I, is, is that an exaggeration? Well, um, I think that it, you know, it's obviously there's there are some limits, I suppose. If they annoyed Congress enough, um, Congress could say, you know, hey, we're going to change the system and we're going to actually make you come to the appropriators. Um, but I was interested last week, Richard Cordray, who's the de facto head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, although actually he um, was never confirmed by, by the Senate. Um, but so he was asked at a hearing, he, can, he always comes in and he says, I come talk to you guys all the time. I'm up on the Hill all the time. And so one of the, one of the senators said to him, OK, well, if you're so willing to come up on the Hill, why don't you come talk to the Appropriations Committee? And he said, I don't have to do that. <laughs> so I think that there's definitely a sense that I'll come talk to you for as, as long as it's comfortable for me, and then I'll go and spend the money that I want to spend. Now, there are some limits on what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau can spend. They're limited to a certain amount of the Fed's uh, money, but it's, the, the limits are really quite small. 
And the Office of Financial Research is completely unbounded in how much it can spend. I find this whole thing with Dodd and Frank absolutely amazing because if you trace it back, trace the breadcrumbs back to the beginning as to what caused the financial crisis, it was government policy um, strong-arming the banks uh, via CRA in order to get uh, public, uh, to achieve public policy goals that they wanted uh, by telling them that, you know, if you don't uh, comply with this uh, CRA requirement or these other requirements, you, we're not going to allow you to do mergers or acquisitions or whatever. And I was a banker when this was all happening, so I saw it up close and personal. So it's amazing to me that the government, poor government policy, public policy, created the financial crisis. Now they've created this monstrosity to try and resolve a problem they created. I agree. And I think what's also shocking is that some of those things that did cause the problems of, you know, telling banks, please don't take into consideration the economics of the loan you're making. Just go ahead and make the loan if we tell you to. They're still doing that. And in fact, Dodd-Frank has uh, one of the titles tells banks to do subsidized lending, subsidized by taxpayer lending. Um, and, and so this notion of, of um, forcing banks to turn a blind eye to whether they're actually going to get paid back because it's okay, Uncle Sam's standing there with a, money, a bag of money. Um, I'm shocked that that didn't get more pushback given the bad experience that we had. Yeah, um, we have a thing in Illinois that's done the legislature. When they write a bill, sometimes it's known as a full employment for attorneys bill <laughs> because there's so many kind of openings for attorneys to make money on. Now, in this particular Dodd-Frank thing, what's the projection out either now or two years down the road or three years down the road? How many attorneys are going to be working for the federal government now in this Dodd-Frank thing? And how many total progressive socialist jobs are there going to be able to be filled? Yeah, I mean, it's actually a great point, and I wish I had brought the numbers because there was a, a government accountability office uh, report that looked at that very question. So the agencies, I think, have combined spent $1.1 billion so far on implementing Dodd-Frank. Um, but keep in mind, they're only a third of the way through, so they're projecting quite a bit more. Um, and the, the number of folks that they have engaged in the process, those are the numbers I don't have. But it's really extraordinary, and it's it's um, certainly a great opportunity for a young attorney who wants to come to Washington and, and make decisions for people in the rest of the country. I can answer that question for you partly. I uh, wrote an article for the Heartland. They were kind enough to publish it. There's going to be a, a through I think between implementation and something like two, 2012 it was estimated. I don't know if they're all attorneys, but regulators, there's going to be 2,850 new people, regulators, needed to uh, comply with this Dodd-Frank, to enforce it and all of that. So at least close to 2,900 new jobs I mean, for regulators. Their average salary is? Don't know. Uh, don't well, know. It, yeah, it depends. Um, you know, at a place like the SEC, the average salary is, I think, around 150000 maybe a little bit more. Um, it's, it's actually very high. The financial regulators on, are on a different scale than um, other government employees. So yes, the Dodd-Frank is a jobs act. Yeah. <laughs> For progressive socialists. Um, Milton Friedman always wrote that one of the problems with regulation was that the regulators and those that are regulated develop a cozy relationship. Right. And the regulators end up protecting the industry that's trying to regulate. I get the impression from some of the things you said that you see this as a possibility. Especially with the large banks? Yeah, I do. And I mean, I'm not going to argue to you that for the large banks, um, complying with this, with this bill is going to be a walk in the park. It's not. Um, but I think if you can be one of the largest banks and you can have this, this relationship with the government to keep you alive, then you really do have an incentive just to build that relationship with your government overseers and, and to worry mostly about that. And so it does, it breeds a very unhealthy system. not my area. I, I don't even know what a derivative is. I don't want to know. I probably couldn't even understand it. But I have a small real estate business. I got about a dozen mortgages, so I know a little bit about it. I paid 161000 in property tax in my very small business last year. So my, what I'm hearing from Dodd-Frank and 
climate change, common core curriculum, Obamacare, to me it all ties into what people are talking about, this Agenda 21 expansion of government. So as far as like, can you comment at all on this? Is this Agenda 21 more of a buzz pertaining to this? Well, I, I mean, I think that what's done in Dodd-Frank and the fact that people have been pretty accepting of it, that government is really kind of taking over where the market before would have been expected to do its job. Um, I think it will set a precedent for other areas, and I think it is part of a larger agenda to to say that you know what we've really uh, we we really need to revisit what the role of government is. And I think there certainly are people who who firmly believe that government needs to be making more decisions for people. And I, I think that's especially uh, clear in the area of consumer financial protection, where um, behavioral behavioral economics is sort of the the new um, area that's affecting that. And they're, they're saying, you know, we look at the way people make decisions and they do it badly. And so we can objectively make better decisions. And it's really a terrifying um, philosophy that if it spreads beyond, certainly will have broader effects on, our, on the way we live. Um, it seems to be that, uh, based on the proposal that you present, it seems to be that you will be reluctant to impose limits on the size of how big a corporation or a financial institution could become. But you certainly are in favor of eliminating other, any implicit guarantee that would promote them to become, became uh, engaged in this risk strategy. But now, how reasonable is to eliminate that once you have an institution like AIG that was already too big? And that was, I guess, the assumption that they had. They didn't have the implicit guarantee, but they knew that the government wouldn't, uh, it would be unreasonable not to save it at that point. So I guess my point is maybe it's, it makes sense to impose limits on the size of financial institutions to prevent that uh, reasoning. So there are a couple responses to that. First, on the AIG point specifically, I would argue that AIG was not too big to fail. At, certainly its failure would have come at a bad time, but it's a big insurance company, right? And so, so the insurance business is something that other insurance companies would have delighted to pick up. Um, and so you could have, one of the arguments, the, the government was really casting around for excuses for why it needed to rescue AIG. Uh, it really wanted to give money to its creditors. So it needed to find a reason. And the reason that it gave was, uh, one of the reasons that it gave was, a lot of people are insured by AIG. What if their insurance company went away? Well, I mean, you go out and you buy a new insurance policy. It's not, it's not the end of the world. So, but putting AIG aside, I understand your point about um, if we have a government that's going to step in and it's going to take these big companies when they start failing and it's going to start bailing them out, then do we need to put limits on? And a lot of people have come to that conclusion. My concern about having the government limit size is that how does it do it? It's arbitrary. And so that in itself, that process in itself, could be a real invasion on uh, the free market. So if, if the government is going to come in and decide which banks to break up, it's going to be the, the folks in the market are going to have an incentive to come to the government and lobby so that they don't get broken up. So could you set the parameters so that I fall outside? And so I think that process itself is dangerous. I do agree with you, though, that there are financial institutions that are bigger than they would be if the market were really in control. And that's why I so firmly believe that we need to uh, put in more controls from the market side. Um, and so if you have market discipline, I'm not sure that an investor wants to invest in a company that they can't understand the financial statements of. So that's where the, the, the pullback should come from, from the investors themselves. Uh, it's certainly a tricky issue, though. Yes. Um, what you said about the rating agencies earlier, that kind of caught my interest. Because uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but during 2008, the MBS contracts were rated AAA by <laughs> basically every single one of the, reg uh, the ratings agencies. Um, how is Dodd-Frank going to, like, because these things were worthless, but they were rating them as almost riskless, how is it going to help at all give accountability to the rating agencies? Um, well, Dodd-Frank talks a lot about rating agencies, and it does, it does um, a couple contrary things. So on the one hand, it says, we're not going to, because the, the government actually required people to rely on ratings. So um, Dodd-Frank did make the change of saying, you know what, we're not going to require people to do that anymore. Um, 
But then they also did some other things. They strengthened the regulatory structure for rating agencies. So now the Securities and Exchange Commission has even more control. They can go in, as they recently did, and they can say, you, credit rating agency, cannot rate this type of bond anymore, this type of security anymore. Um, now, you can still do it, but you have to put a big disclaimer saying, the government doesn't sanction me as a rater of this type of security. So what is the implicit message of that? That means that for other securities rated by, by firms that are sanctioned, people are going to say, well, the SEC signed off on it, so I think that, that it's fine. Now, maybe the SEC will hire some people from the Fed. Those people from the Fed also happen to miss the fact that we were about to have a housing crisis. So there's not the expertise in government to figure out the, what's going on with securities. And I think the, what Dodd-Frank should have done is pull these credit rating agencies totally out of the regulatory structure, allow the market participants to decide who they want to rely on to give them advice about which securities they purchase. Um, and then I think we would see rating agencies thrive or fail based upon whether they were doing a job that met their... As it, as it stands, uh, like let's say I, if I wanted to set up a rating agency mm -hmm. just for the sake of argument, um, are you allowed to do that? or are Sure. Okay. You're allowed to do that, but if you want to have the government seal of approval, oh, okay, you you got to go to the government, and they'll probably tell you no, I'm sorry. Yeah. You I have to hire a compliance <laughs> officer. That's one thing you'll need to do. Uh, one more, time for one more question? Uh, Ms. Pierce, great talk. just want to ask you, do you think uh, if we scrap this Dodd Frank thing and, and reinstitute H. Glass Siegel, that uh, we'd be back where we were for the, you know, those 60 years that we enjoyed the growth and stability of the market? You know, I really don't think Glass Siegel is the answer. Um, again, that's arbitrary government decisions about what financial firms can and cannot do. It sort of tried to draw lines between banks and between securities firms. Um, I really think that we need to get to a place where um, it's not the government making decisions about what activities firms should be engaged in, but the market um, making those decisions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.